and the Houston Rockets and the Golden State Warriors in Game 7. Rockets need to attack the basket. Houston has to continue to keep their foot on the gas. Warriors always within striking distance. The energy of Houston just doesn't seem to be there. And the Golden State Warriors are on their way to a fourth consecutive NBA final. The 65 win Rockets are not gone. Hey everybody, welcome into our NBA TV studios. I'm Kristen Ledlow, Drew Gooden, Brennan Haywood. Uh, over the next 30 minutes, we're going to run through 10 points on the Rockets. You guys ready to talk about the team that was one game away from the NBA Finals? Let's get it started. Might Let's as get well, it right? Okay, so before we get into the season ahead, Chris Paul and James Harden had this to say about the season behind. Tough. Tough, um, but you know, no one's gonna feel sorry for us or even me. Right. Um, you know, took a couple weeks, you know, mm -hmm. to to heal up, get healthy, and then it was right back to work. You know, you got to try to have a short memory. I always, you know, you know, remember, you know, what what happened, but I, I had to get back to work. We were pretty co close in, in in Chris's first year, and so. Uh, obviously, we added some new guys, um, and so we got to get these guys on the same page and, and uh, keep this shit going. The Rockets held a 3-2 lead over the Warriors in the Western Conference Finals before Chris Paul was ruled out for Game 6 and 7 with a hamstring injury. Uh, the Game 7 loss was particularly disheartening as the Rockets, a team that set a record for the most three-pointers in the regular season, went 7 of 44 mm. from behind the arc, including 27 misses in a row. It's not good. They lived by the three. They died by the three. How long does it take to overcome a, a mental loss like that? Well, I think it sits with you for a couple of days, and sometimes it can even hang with you during the summer. But Drew, as Drew can tell you, in that type of situation, what you can do is you can use that as your motivation. That's what wakes you up. That's your why. That's your drive. And in those summers where you don't feel like getting up, putting that extra work in, you start thinking about that game seven. You start thinking about those experiences. So I don't think there'll be a hangover. If anything, I think that'll motivate this team. It'll push them to be better because they realized they were so close. They had the champs on the ropes, and now they just have to take it a step further. You know what? To add to your point, Brendan, when you set a standard for yourself, you get to wake up every day and work towards that standard. And going to the championship, uh, excuse me, the Western Conference Finals last year, and believe me, I think they had their chance last year uh, being up 3-2 in that series, unfortunately missing 27 three-point attempts during that stretch. I mean, that's going to haunt them. Now, do you wake up now and go to the gym and shoot more threes? Uh, you know, you said live by the three, die by the three. Are there going to be some changes? Um, losing Coach B, <clears throat> Jeff, who uh, stepped down recently, uh, is going to be a big blow to Houston Rockets Definitely. on a defensive Definitely. end. And now you got to think, can you not only sh be that three-point shooting team, or are you going to be the same defensive team to be able to compete against the Golden State Warriors? So I, the I love game that too. seven loss aside then, look at the series in its entirety. This was a team that had the eventual champions on the ropes. Does that not carry over into the start of a coming season? I think it's more, uh, have you seen... The Ace uh, Ventura Peck Detective, those yes. gym kids. It's so like bad. Ray Finkel lays this out. You know, it's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna haunt you. It's gonna haunt you forever. You know what I mean? So I think you don't want that hangover, but you know in the back of your head that these, this is the team to beat. They're, they're the champs, and you could have been a champion. Yeah, I don't like I said. I don't think there's gonna be a hangover. I think you made a great point about the defense. I think the biggest thing for this team is moving forward. Um, how do we approach our business? They've added some other pieces, and defensively, can we be the same team? The games that they did win. They didn't win because of their offense. They won those games because they were able to slow the game down, make it ugly for Golden State. Go back and look at the box scores. They were able to make those games ugly, ugly basketball games. Yeah. That's the way you're going to beat the Golden State Warriors. So you made an excellent point. The defensive coach not being there, that changes things, and that is what they're going to have to worry about more than a championship, hang than, a, not a, than a Western Conference championship hangover. Well, not only did they make some key additions, but in July, Chris Paul agreed with the Rockets on a four-year contract worth $160 million. Oh, wait! Must wow. be nice, right? When, when I say the boy got his own money, he got his own <laughs> money! He's a nine-time All-Star. He's now 33 years old, entering his 14th season in the NBA. He had this to say about taking care of his body at this age. I've got an amazing team around me, you know, uh, obviously our training staff with the team, but, you know, my family, my support system, trainers, everything like that, um, you know, with the way the league is now, there's really no off season, you know, so mm -hmm. it's conditioning, eating right, and, um, 
you know, hopefully to a, a healthy season this year. How big, though, an impact was CP, not just statistically, but as a leader with that team? Well, I think he was huge because he gave that secondary voice. Sometimes some people question whether James Harden was the leader of that team. I don't know. Only he can answer that. But I know as far as when you watch on the court, you could see how people, how the teammates responded to Chris Paul, how he was able to lead the team. He was able to hit big shots down the stretch. He always seemed like he was, even if he was having a bad night, he was the guy the team gravitated to. I always watch huddles when I watch games. I watch who's talking, who's getting the guys going. And when you watch, even when he was hurt, Chris Paul was the guy getting everybody together. Hey, come on, man. We still got a chance to win this game. Come, we can do this. We have to get things done the right way. So I think he's the leader of that team. You can't put a price tag on that because leadership is key in this league. You know, we all know they're a great team with Harden. Right. But with Chris Paul, they're that much better. I mean, it's a staggering stat out there. I don't know what it was, but there's a stat that when they play together, I think they had like one loss last year <laughs> during, during the season. So uh, when you put those two together and then you add guys like Carmelo Anthony now, and like I said, that standard of already almost beating Golden State, you know, it, it becomes reality. You know, it's just not a, a team that's on paper now. It's a team that's actually been there before. And it's reality now, and they have something to strive for. I'm glad Chris Paul got that contract this summer. Uh, he could have probably been, uh, you know, out there a little longer in free agency, but I'm glad they, uh, they brought him back. We've yeah. heard him talk about, though, taking care of his body at 33. How much longer can he be effective as a starting point guard on a championship contender in the NBA? I mean, that's, that's up to him and health. Uh, and, you know, taking care of your body. It, he said it best. I mean, you, you don't want to from tearing, almost tearing his hamstring last year, or his quad, or whatever it was, uh, to coming into this season, you got to think his antennas are up, trying to be healthy. Because it's a little part of him probably feels like it's his fault that they did not win the championship. So uh, he's going to work continuously. He just got a, a huge deal. If that's not an incentive to be work harder and take care of your body, I don't know what is. So uh, I think he's going to be concentrating on taking care of his body at 34 years old and in it for the long haul for the Houston Rockets. Yeah, I think Chris Paul definitely has a couple of seasons where he can still play at an elite level. He's continued to mature as a basketball player. Not as fast, not as quick as he once was, but he makes up with that. He's gotten better as an offensive player. He understands how to play the game from with, to his speed now. So he's wiser as a basketball player. He also knows that he has to eat the right things. He has to put the time in with his body to make sure that he's light, he's fit, and he does all those things. He's a very hard worker. So I think he has a couple more seasons left because not only does he do, put the time in off the court, but he's a smart basketball player. Aging basketball players have to change their game slightly. Chris Paul has done that. It's really a lesson for all of us, though. It's more of a life Miller. lesson. Yeah. yeah. Andre Miller. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. But later in July, one of CP's buddies, Carmelo Anthony, agreed with the Rockets on a one-year contract worth $2.4 million. He was involved in a three-way trade that brought him to Atlanta, ultimately being cleared by waivers. And keep in mind, Melo has a well-documented history with Coach Mike D'Antoni, but recently he addressed their relationship with our Allie LaForce. It was good for us to, us meeting myself and Dan Tony to just have a real conversation. And, you know, I was younger, he was younger. Uh, being in New York, you know, can cause a lot of tension itself and a lot of stress itself. Uh, it's one of the toughest media markets. Yeah, of course, of course. But for the most part, it was, it was just good to have that, that dialogue with him and yeah. kind of get that out the way first. And then now we can just focus on winning the championship. That's it. So they've discussed it, but considering their history, do you see this perhaps posing a problem? I don't think it, can, it will pose a problem because I think uh, Carmelo Anthony realized that life is a little bit different outside of New York. <laughs> Last year for the first time, he had to be the third option. And it's not about him getting his shots anymore in his area. It's about how do I fit in with the other guys? Because now he's a complimentary piece. He's not the main guy. So I think they definitely talked about that. I think Mike D'Antoni is an excellent offensive coach. He's going to put Carmelo in a position to succeed. But Carmelo has to understand uh, some nights it's not going to be his night. The body language has to be great. Some nights in the fourth quarter, he's not going to finish games. He has to continuously uh, clap and support his teammates, which he normally does. But the cameras are going to be on him. It's all four appearances. And so I'm sure that him and Mike D'Antoni have talked about that, how we're going to use you, your different role, and how you're going to fit in with this team. I think the good thing... Melo has seen this role already, and that was last year in Oklahoma yeah. City. But he didn't like it last year in Oklahoma. But he had a, he had a taste of it. Yes. You know what I mean? So now it's nothing new to him being the third option or fourth option. But one thing is going to point out, and it's the question, does he start? 
She has to start. Now, P.J. Tucker, you know, I think that's a piece right there that's been proven. You know, he's he, he's a guy that could play defense at that stretch four position. He can knock down the outside three, and he's proven already in that system. Do you start P.J. or do you start Carmelo Anthony? I think you start both. You go with P.J., Carmelo, uh, James Harden, Chris Paul, and Capella. I like that five. Okay. Well, we see. That's well, why like, we got the coach. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I, like, I, I think. Th I think that. I think that works. And then, like I said, even though Carmelo has to give a little bit of himself as far as from an offensive standpoint, I think not starting him is something he's not ready to give up just yet. Everybody thinks the NBA is just all athletic or all being able to shoot. No, you still need those fundamentals um, from when you were taught to an eight-year-old to you know when you're a 28, 29-year-old in the NBA. There's a lot of moves and a lot of decision making that you have to make within a small time frame um, in order to be one of those elite guys. So as I come down, my head is up and I just, ooh, got you. That right there happens in two seconds, maybe less than that. It gotta be a quick decision. Obviously I'm a playmaker and I gotta make sure I get all my guys involved, but I'm a scorer as well. So as I come down as a playmaker and scorer, myself is first, get by him, then I make the next decision. If he comes to step up, I throw the lob to Clint. If he doesn't step up, I go dunk the ball. If that guy, if the big comes over and helps, and that guy sinks in, then I got one of my shooters in the corner, all right? Well, if I don't like that move, or he doesn't go for that move, then I have to find another move to create the balance that I need for a shot. Might be behind the back, in and out, hezzy. Side step, he jumps for it, hesitation. Now I gotta make my four or five decisions that we just talked about. That was James Harden on the Players' Tribune. Harden earned MVP honors last season, but he also knows what it feels like to finish second. So much so, guys, that he chose not to write an acceptance speech for the NBA awards. He said, the last four years have been like knocking on the door. Now, the moment is finally here. We're looking at the statistical improvement over the last three seasons. He so was you last... tell me he was just up there winging it? See, yes. That's why it looked like a, an Oscar winner or, you know, the overwhelmed with emotion. Okay. Because there was zero preparation in advance. You just saw it. He makes quick decisions. All right. In two seconds. Yeah. It went well. <laughs> he was last That's how much planning went into the speech. <laughs> two seconds. Two seconds. Champion. He led his team to a league best 65 wins. What, though, is it about his game that makes him so difficult to stop? What makes him so difficult to guard is the unpredictability. You saw all the moves he's talking about, the quick hesitations and the, the hezos, the crossovers, the body line language, the Euros, he can do everything and he's excellent at getting to the free throw line, so that's what makes him so hard to guard because you really don't know what he's going to do. He has so many moves. Now, everybody knows he really wants to get left, but the thing is, he has eight to nine moves that can get to his left, and then he has these incredible fakes, and then he gets guys to bite on moves, the pick and rolls, he forces you to do certain things. So he has a lot of incredible ways to, to get all of his moves off, even though he's not the best ball, I mean, he's not the best athlete in the world, his ball handling and his shot making is incredible. Well, you know, James always starts his move with a move. Yeah. You know, it's whether it's a jab step towards you to get you swaying, and it's almost like a boxer's mentality that he has when he has the ball in his hand. It's almost like, hey, if I get you leaning one way, I'm going to go right and you're done. So it's almost like a, having a boxer's mentality out there when he has the ball. Now, <clears throat> trying to guard him. Ooh. Yeah, I was going to ask <laughs> how you do let's that. Let's talk about, yeah, ask two backup centers how <laughs> yeah. to guard James Harden. Which one of us has to be James Harden because we both can't dribble. <laughs> <laughs> well, your antennas are up because one thing he does a great job of is drawing fouls, and that is if your arms, if you're reaching, whatever, if your arms are in the way, you're going to be on the bench next to the coach because you will get in foul trouble. I think the best way to guard James Harden is to space him. You know, space him. At the end of the day, if he shoots a contested three-point shot, we win. You don't lose because if you try to go out there and play one-on-one -on -one defense with him, you so get in foul right, trouble. So if I'm James Harden, I got the ball, you going to space me? I got to space you. I got to. But you, but you know, he, you know, hey. he, Ah, he's right into it. And, and I did my job. <laughs> and I did my job. Now, if I get up on him, now I'm playing into his hands. I'm playing and getting in foul trouble. And now I'm also getting my, my teammates involved in rotations. And like you saw in that clip, you, now you have, a hey, if the guy steps up, I have the lob to the rim to Clint Capella. If he doesn't step up or this guy steps up, I have my shooter there in the corner. So this, 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 the decision-making is starting on guys pressing up on him and allowing him to go one-on-one. -on -one.
Yeah, I definitely agree with what you said. It's a team aspect, too. The first thing you have to do is you can't allow him to get left. It's easier said than done. You have to force him to his right hand. I'm a little bit different than you. I don't like to give elite guys space. I like mm -hmm. to get up into your hip, but at the same time, now this time you have the ball. Mm -hmm. Go right here. I like to, like, I'm just saying, I, w I would rather see them force him right, but make sure you're sliding, and when you pick up, he's gonna, he wants you to reach. Mm -hmm. You have to have the discipline to have your hands back and then, go, and then go straight up. Then you got this. <laughs> well, listen, that, that, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 doing all that. that's, 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 that's where all your help is, but I think the biggest thing is you have to get him to his hip. You have to force him to his right. You have to hope your teammates are there to help you. You can't go for a lot of the fakes. Once again, easier said than done. You can't go for a lot of fakes because he has a lot of fakes to the right to go right back to the left. You have to be disciplined. If you want to watch a great film of how to guard him, watch the Golden State Warriors. They do a great job of trying to force him to his right hand into the help. Well, guys, despite the Rockets finishing with the best record in the NBA, they still made significant offseason moves. Trevor Ariza, Ryan Anderson, Luke Baamute no longer on the team. They did, though, make key acquisitions in Brandon Knight, Michael Carter Williams, James Ennis, Marquise Chris, and of course, Carmelo Anthony. So the question is is this roster, as currently constructed, meant to outlast the Warriors? You know, that roster right there looks great on paper, but I think losing guys like Trevor Ariza, who was not only that shooter in the corner, that James was talking about in that. Yeah, but the leader, uh, the guy that did the intangibles, the guy that guarded the best player uh, on a nightly basis uh, for the Houston Rockets. So when you lose a piece like that, uh, I think it's going to take more than just Carmelo Anthony, more than uh, that trade to kind of fill in that void. I definitely agree. I think you hit it right on the head. A guy like Trevor Reza, you can't put a price on what he brings to a team. He brings leadership. He brings harmony in the locker room. More importantly, he brings that tough tenacity from a defensive standpoint. When you watch when they played Golden State, he was the guy that went one-on-one -on -one with Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant won a lot of those battles, but he made life tough on Kevin Durant, and that's all you can do. I don't know if they have that guy right now that can guard Kevin Durant. And I said earlier in the show, and I'll say it again, the three games that they won in that series were all defensive wins. I don't think you can beat the Golden State Warriors in an up-and-down uh, seven-game series trying to beat them with offense. It has to be defense. Losing Trevor Reza, they've lost their defensive identity, along with their defensive, uh, defensive coach. The Houston Rockets set an NBA record for the most three-pointers made in a season. That was breaking the record that they had set the season before. And last season, the Rockets finished with a franchise best 65 wins that was good for best in the Western Conference. So guys, this season, will the team win more or less than 56 games? I would say less. Uh, losing their coach and Coach B, losing Trevor Reza, who I think was the glue guy for their team, I think it's less. I'm going to go more. I, think, I still think they're one of the best two teams in the Western Conference. They still have James Harden. They still have Chris Paul. They still have Capella. I think you said it best. That group really doesn't lose a lot of games when they're together. So they've missed some pieces, and they're definitely missing their defensive coach and Ariza. But I still think this team is the, one of the best teams in the Western Conference, right below the Golden State Warriors. I think they go over that. So you think more. I'm taking the over. Do you still think that they are the closest to outlasting the Warriors? In the West or in general? In general. In general, no. You think someone in the East then could perhaps Ooh. beat Do the Warriors? Smell some Celtics green? Celt the Celtics, I man. Had I, a think the Celtics, I think the Celtics in Toronto have better personnel to match up with Golden State right now.